Welcome everybody to Dat Poker Podcast, episode 85. It is October 12th, 2020. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz. Uh, this podcast presented by Daniel Negran, who's Masterclass of Poker, masterclass.com. Head on over, uh, sharpen up your poker game with lessons from the man we will talk to in one second. But uh, first, producer extraordinaire, Roscoe P. Coltrane. Uh, for the record, it's a place called Ottawa. <laughs> Yes, Ottawa, uh, and uh, Terrence Chan is in Kelowna. Uh, well, Bruce, Bruce Buffer actually said that once when there was a uh, when there's a UFC fighter from from Kelowna. Actually, a bit of a downer day here. My my day um, to bring everybody to a real down start. I I was I took my kid to the park today. We started driving home. Um, I don't live in the city of Kelowna. I live uh, about 25 minutes outside of it. And uh, on, a, on a twisty highway and um, saw the car suddenly in front of me pull up and stop. Um, so I stop and the, a motorcyclist had had, I had a, a collision with a, with a vehicle and he was flown very far, motorcycle very far from him, uh, called 911 right away. And, and um, they asked me, you know, is he breathing? You know, they do all the things. Um, and, um, you know, he was, he was breathing. Um, his eyes were open, but uh, as sort of, we were leaving the scene because all the other first responders had got there, I saw them doing chest compressions and I'm, I'm there with my daughter in the car and I'm just kind of like, you know, she's not even three, you know, she doesn't understand anything of what's going on. And it's just like, I'm trying to act like, like just like everything is cool, but also like, I, I don't want it to be too cool because it's like serious. And I think she like senses them energy. And I was like, well, that's, that's a, that's a lousy part of the day. And it's such a shitty feeling to, to not even know, like, I don't know what happened to the guy. Like I can't even bring myself to like check the local news feed to see if he made it or not. I just kind of, I hope he does, but I'm kind of scared that he didn't. And then like, yeah, so that was like probably a, best a, off not knowing. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean like, so, so, you know, people out there, you know, they ride motorcycles and stuff and I would never take away anybody's ride, right to ride a motorcycle. I understand you, it's your own personal decision and stuff like that. It's not, not one I would make um, right now, even though I do ride ride a scooter sometimes. Um, but just take care out there. It's uh, it was it was really it was really rough to see that to like just go like face to face with somebody who was you know like it seems like a coin flip whether they were going to live or die. It's it's pretty rough start. Tough start. Today. Tough yeah. start. Uh, Daniel Legrand, hopefully you uh, did not uh, witness anybody dying today. Yeah, on a lighter on a much lighter note. You know, I've been focusing on the news here. In the United States, most importantly, in Washington, Dick. <laughs> what well, I think that's right. Washington, yeah. Dick. Right. <laughs> Ottawa. Apparently, you know, so we're obviously referencing what you heard in the clip. You know, the uh, uh, Ottawa. I heard that he actually because I thought like this is the dumbest thing ever, but apparently he does this on purpose. And supposedly, of course, his supporters are like, do you know that's how it's actually closer to the natives pronounce it? <laughs> So they literally, that was what I got back. It's like, you dumb libtard. You don't even know that he's pronouncing it properly and everyone else says it wrong. So yeah. By the way, I made the mistake of reading like uh, some of the, the YouTube comments and people were like, I think we made a joke about the debate. Didn't we make a joke about the debate last show, right? Right off the top. We talked about it for like two seconds. Didn't really get into politics. It was just laughing about it. And in the comments, people were like, yeah, no, I checked out as soon as you guys started talking. I'm like, <laughs> We did an hour and a half and talked about 90 seconds. We made a joke about and people are like, yeah, oh, no. snowflakes. See you and next no, week. They did not. That's what people say. Like, oh, I tuned out. No, you, you, you listen to the whole thing. We know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just to piss them off even more. Let's talk some NHL because the uh, draft and free agency happening. we got a tight hour tonight. We're sticking to an hour. We're not going over an hour. We're getting to as much as we can an hour, but we want to get to a quick Two minutes ago. Yeah, you had to talk about Eric Goodbranson going to the Senators. Oh, that was that was fantastically terrible. But no, um, we've uh, acquired uh, one of uh, Las Vegas Golden Knights' uh, key defenders, which I'm quite excited about. Nate Schmidt came to the Canucks for a third rounder. Daniel, what can you tell us about Nate Schmidt? Is he going to fit in on our top top uh, pairing with Quinn Hughes? Well, Nate Schmidt is like the, this. Is really this team? What's happening in Vegas is really strange. They're taking every heart and soul guy who is the identity of this team and like getting rid of them. It feels like it's a dangerous thing. If I have their phone number, they're going. <laughs> like they're, they're leaving. <laughs> um, really sad for Nate. I mean, obviously if they're going to bring in a guy like Petrangelo, you have to move, move cap. And, it, and this is really going to be strange. And it makes sense for this season because it's a shortened season. It looks like they're going to have to keep Flurry and Laner. 
Uh, as far as Schmidt in a locker room, you're going to love him in interviews and stuff like that. He's the, got the best personality by far. He's got charisma. He jokes like, uh, what did he say? Something like, basically, because when I saw, we, we talked, someone made the reference, like he'd be the me of poker or vice versa or something like that. Cause he's a very, you know, outgoing guy, lots of fun, grinds hard. I think his, uh, he's slow. He was, he's been slowed since that knee injury. Like you, you net, you definitely notice like a, like a step and a half missing for the second half of the season. So if he's healthy, you know, he can return to form like that. I mean, it's a great pickup for you, for you guys in Vancouver. Like, I mean, that seems like a, a guy that can plug a lot of holes. Yeah, we're pretty happy about getting somebody to play up on that top uh, top four. All right, that's enough hockey. Well, you got uh, Alex. Wait, Petrangelo. wait, I, I was, I was, I just did it in time to to, to ask because uh, I, I believe we have one like and one hate on the uh, the Vegas uh, third jersey. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the puke yellow. That's but I think Daniel likes. It's a little Nashville-y. I like the color. I mean, actually, I, I was I was surprised. I thought it would look really gaudy and awful, but I actually like it. Uh, what did you think of quickly Petrangelo? That's a long, long nine million for seven years. Wow, I think it's too much money. But like, here's the thing that I mean, Brian Burke said it best. Actually, he said, you know, Vegas is developing like kind of a dangerous reputation of showing a lack of loyalty. Right? We're going to sign you to a long term contract and then ship you out. Gerard Gallant, come into the office. We're going to sign you. Oh, you're fired. You know, Flurry, you're our guy. Oh no, Laners are. You know, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. Like. Eric Hall, there's just so many situations where that's happening where you start to develop a reputation that's not necessarily good, where you get it, right? Ownership wants to do whatever it takes to win, but at what cost, right? And sometimes there is a cost. So Petrangelo, I think the deal is too long and like too much money. And I, my biggest concern is the magic of this team. What made it special was the fact that, you know, obviously in year one, it was a group of misfits, the golden misfits from all over the, you know, the league. Um, and that slowly dissipated. And I think that they are a little bit arrogant in the idea that like the fan base is just going to keep showing up because you keep doing stuff like that. you like, okay, you trade our favorite head coach, you trade our favorite player, you get rid of our goalie, which they didn't, but you know, it looks like that. It's like, wait a minute, you know, what, oh, you, you like where can you just get away with doing that? And they have been so far, but I don't know if NBA comes and got the NFL, that could be problematic for them down the road. Uh, all right, let's quickly move on to, and I just want to touch on this quick because I'm, I'm, it struck me all week, and I've been watching the presidential election markets, and, I, and without getting into you know who the the actual you know Trump versus Biden, the lines are interesting to me because yes, uh, I know what happened last time with the polling data and everything, but the polling data is so one sided in in favor of Biden, and the market. It doesn't seem to have reflected that until recently. I think it's gone to uh, Biden minus 250 or something today. But I think even like a day or two ago, it was Biden minus 200. And if you look at the polling data, it's, you know, and I get people are all going to say, oh, the polling data doesn't use and we're going to get a million comments. But wow. I think if you look at it in a vacuum, you and you looked at the polling data and went, is that predictive in any way, the market would be way less than or way higher, sorry, way worse than minus 200 on Biden. Right. So I wanted to, I, it, it looks to me like the market is, is kind of inefficient in a way. And I see all these poker players with huge amounts of money on the election. Daniel, I know you're one of them too, but I, I don't know. Is it just me who thinks this market's way off or, or am I missing something? My goodness. If I think you, it always makes more sense to trust the betting market which is where people are actually putting money on something like this. Like, here's the mistake I think that's made. Okay, so the polling shows a certain number, right? That's based, that polling is based on a national poll that isn't the game. It's like, it's just not the game. The game is winning the electoral college, right? So when you do that, you have to look at polling in very specific states, right? So a betting market is going to take into account the game as rigged as it is or whatever you want to call it, right? And, and factor that in. But obviously, if you look at California, that's not a toss-up. We all know, you know, that uh, the Democrats are going to win there. But uh, I think the biggest difference is the fact that, uh, like I said, you know, national polling is kind of irrelevant. Oh, yeah. Will Biden win the popular vote? That's like 12 to 1, right? He's going to win the popular vote. That's a given. It, a Democratic president will always, or candidate would seem to always win the popular vote for the next 20 years unless some, some drastic things change. But this is what the Republicans are just good at. It doesn't matter that more people are going to vote for the other guy. They still find a way to win by winning in the right states. Terrence, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I have I have Biden money on. I mean, that's that's mostly just a function of people who are smarter than me thinking that it's a good bet. And I, I got in on a long time ago, at like minus one thirty. So if I really wanted to, I could arb out now. 
I mean, there's, there's obvious, you have to also take into consideration of what happened last time. And, you know, the poll said Hillary was ahead too, and the model said that Hillary was ahead and you had some, you had some correlational issues with the, the, the polling during the last election. And that's probably going to make the market a little shy from betting the favorite here. I think that there, there's, there's definitely some aspect of that happening now, you know, Daniel points out it's about the electoral college. I mean, I think, um, I, th I think the models know that too. Um, the betting, you know, the betting in general, I'm a really big fan of, of what the betting market indicates. Um, so that obviously means Doug Polk is six times better at no limit hold'em than Daniel Negreanu. Um, if we extend that logic, but, um, but yeah, so, but I, I think in this case, it's, it's worth a, a bet on Biden. Certainly at the, certainly at the prices that were like happening last week, like minus 170 and minus 160. Now it's starting to push forward a little. Uh, all right, uh, quickly, and there was some stuff happened this week. There, we'll get to quick to touch on it. Um, one of them was there was a poker player on Twitter who was offering incredible lines to people who wanted to bet on the Lakers to win this, you know, the Western Championship or or even the championship. And you know, if they were minus two hundred, he was offering you know two to one because he was so convinced. Started like completely um, offering ridiculous lines and getting people to post first. And he, they, his people got ripped off because the guy took off with the money. And it's like, yeah, no kidding. He offered huge, you know, he offered lines. Not a well-known guy, just like a random. I think he was kind of well-known or not well-known, but, you know, known by some people. And he, apparently hundreds of thousands of dollars, people would just ship him money first. What's that, his name? That, I mean, we should be outing scammers. I care, I'd have to look it up. But uh, okay. it's just a friendly reminder. Like if somebody's offering you some ridiculous line and wanting you to send money first, like don't do it. There's it's a not like very Nigerian-like, like, I have 20 million locked up in a safe that I can't get to. So send just 20,000 and it opens it up and I can give you half. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll send that check right away. Yeah, don't do it. Um, they call people like that, by the way. It's funny. So they call them mugus. Like you're a mugu. Like in Nigeria, that's what you're basically a mugu is a mark who like falls for this shit. Nice. Okay. Don't be a Mugu. Uh, all right. Uh, speaking of Mugus, there was uh, 266 uh, runners in a 1K tournament in uh, Chicago last week. Uh, this was a charity event called the Midway Poker Tour, um, and it was held in a hotel there in Chicago. And uh, they didn't have the money to pay out because it, the way the charity works or the laws that uh, you can't pay more than $500 over the buy-in. So if you, it's a thousand dollar buy-in, you can't get more than 1500. And they decided that they were going to compensate the winners um, in precious metals, I believe silver uh, with the remaining amount because they they got 266 runners and a $1,000 buy-in with a hundred K uh, guarantee. First prize was going to end up being 55,000. So they ended up, you know, trying to um, give these poker players silver for the difference in the, you know, in the amount won. Um, and, you know, of course it went sideways. The guy that owns the mid stakes poker tour wasn't on site and then kind of left these people to deal with it. They didn't really know what they're doing. Chad Holloway was actually on site covering the tournament and he ended up, uh, I think helping out and documenting everything that happened. But, um, you know, and in fairness to the 266 people, they didn't know before the tournament, it wasn't stated that this was how you're going to get paid. However, if you're going to enter a, ch a charity poker tournament in a city, maybe that, you know, probably doesn't, hasn't had too many of these tournaments in the past, maybe do a little bit of homework on, on how you're actually going to get paid or if you're going to get paid. So um, just to, to bring everybody's attention, I don't, did you guys read that? And uh, did you have any sort of reaction to it? Yeah, there's, well, there's even more sketchiness with that. Apparently a lot of people were being told that they had to, if, it, you know, they were asked for like their poker bros and, and poker bros for those who don't know is one of these like peer to peer um, poker sites that sort of gray market where, where no money actually exchanges hands. But, but, you know, it's, it's, it's done underground. It's, it's sort of a, it's, it's become very popular since, since COVID and people playing at home in the U S. So apparently if you had a poker bros account, you had to give them your name. If you didn't have one, you were, you were forced to sign up right there and use them as an affiliate. So that right there tells you like, this is some shady shit going on. Um, I think Poker Bros actually, to their credit, terminated this guy's uh, affiliate account immediately um, once this came to light. Um, hopefully they would have done that too, even if it doesn't come out. And then I think some other stuff came out about this guy also uh, doing some bad things in the past, uh, you know, getting in, getting in legal trouble. So seems super shady all around. Uh, I, I, I'd like, to, I'd like some, I definitely like some action against another midway poker tour event happening again. Looks very bad for them. Um, 
they've claimed that they're going to try to make it up if they're able to do so, which is like, I don't understand. You collected all this money for a prize pool. Why would you not have the money? Um, yeah, makes a, makes, also makes a really strong case for, uh, for, for cryptocurrency and cause, cause probably people would be a lot less pissed off. I mean, it would still be like an annoyance if you got paid in Bitcoin, if you had, if you won like 55 K and you're, you're not like a Bitcoin person, but still you can like liquidate that pretty easily. You're probably going to only pay like a couple cents of juice on it. Not that big a deal. Um, but paying people out in fucking actual literal silver coins and, just like, why not pay them in Beanie Babies? <laughs> like, just, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest issue, right, is like, listen, if this, you know, it's kind of funny, this whole thing. It's sad, but it's also kind of funny. Like, if they were actually giving people the a- appropriate amount of value on the silver coins or whatever, then, I mean, listen, it sucks, but at least you can get your money's worth. But they weren't. So you're yeah. getting like, oh, you get $500 extra, and they're going to give you this coin that they say is worth 500 it's really worth like $42 or something like that. Yeah. Right? And they shorted everybody 30%. Yeah. yeah that was a good so point. They shorted. Like yeah. 10X markup after the fact when you, when you do this kind of thing. So certainly awkward and weird. Um, you know, it's, someone put this joke on. I was like, I don't get the, what the issue is. You know, people chase the world series for precious metal, like, you know, gold bracelets. Why, why is this any uh, different? You'd think they'd be like super happy to get, you know, all these medals. Right. Um, <laughs> that was kind of funny, but yeah, really kind of an awkward thing for, you know, to, to have happen in like 2020, right? This sounds very like 1885 where, you know, during the bull rush, we're like, yeah, winner of this year, tournament right here, right there, I'm going to get them some extra silver there. I'm killed here. I don't know. You know Win so your weight in silver. Yeah. yeah you know, we, uh, we give guys like Chainsaw like a hard time because he'll crawl up inside structures and, you know, things like, you know, the payouts and rules in the local area and stuff. But this is why you need guys like Chainsaw yeah. in this totally for this situation, right? Uh, all right, uh, let's move on. Uh, one of the main things uh, that was happening on Twitter this week was uh, our uh, fine co-host was going back and forth regarding the uh, upcoming match that uh, you have with one Doug Polk. And uh, there was some discussion about um, if you guys were going to have pre-flop charts available to be used by both parties. Now, uh, for those that don't know, uh, pre-flop charts are used, uh, are allowed to be used in some instances and some they're not. Um, there are charts that tell you pre-flop, you have this hand, you can do this, this, and this, and, you know, I guess it's in percentage. I've never seen one in my life, so I, I don't know what one looks like, but um, you, Daniel, decided that you didn't want to have uh, pre-flop charts. So you wanted to be, you know, you want it to be more like a head-to-head sort of one man, one hand, and let's play poker against each other and see what happens rather than have charts, which, by the way, kind of surprised me a little bit why Doug dug his heels in and wanted to use these charts. Doug's been a you know head up crusher for a long time. I'm surprised he still needs them at, at, on some level because he's played so many hands of heads up, no limit hold them. Why maybe well, I'm missing something? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of pre flop decisions that would come along that he would be confused by. But um, Daniel, why don't you uh, sort of give us a rundown of uh, of what you uh, what, how it went back and forth for you? Yeah, well, where you're getting to something that is actually where the scary part uh, occurs, and that's you know the complex decisions that are made. That, that, that the root is, I, I put, reposted a video by this guy, GTOX, uh, Finding Equilibrium. I put it on Twitter earlier today. Um, and it explains kind of like everyone has this idea that like, or some people have this idea that, well, pre-flop, you know, charts should be okay. Whereas like post-flop, oh no, no way, right? But really, you know, pre-flop and post-flop, those are just decisions in a game tree, right? So you could theoretically have like a database or a spreadsheet of every potential flop right? King nine, three, da, 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 da. You could scroll through it and look at the lines, right? And, you know, just have that in a chart. Like it's not a breathing, living, um, adjusting um, document. It's, it's static and it's written, but a lot of people would, everyone would be opposed to that, right? That well, would, that's exactly what Max Kuros was doing. That's exactly right. what he did. Yes. So, so everyone would be opposed to that, right? Well, you take an extension, you know, back, like personally, I don't, I mean, I understand that from a online operator's perspective, it's, really difficult to police anything like this. But listen, I have a choice, right? When I first, I didn't really understand what he wanted to do. And then when I understood the complexity of what his charts may do, which is start a visualized game tree that, um, you know, it, it, it frames out the game tree for like flop, turn, and river. Like now, now we're talking like gray area. As you mentioned, you know, for my pre-flop study that I've been doing, I'd say that memorization-wise, I'm probably 90, 92% efficient in that neighborhood. I'm going to make mistakes. But I feel like, why should two people, right? Because I have access to all the same information, 
right? We all do, right? I mean, it's not all that complicated preflop poker. I could literally have the exact same preflop thing as he does. And then we're literally not making any decisions before the flop. He's not making any decisions because he clicks his randomizer and opens with queen three suited when it says to. I'm doing the same thing. So essentially, we're completely eliminating the skill of, of, of preflop poker, right? And just delaying it to the flop. Uh, and then that's if, you know, you're not using anything past that. So once it was explained to me, because at first I was like, I don't know, it didn't seem like that big a deal, right? Because what's the big deal? Um, but then when it was explained to me that it was, I'm like, well, why should I give up this advantage, right? My advisors, when they heard that, because like I was tweeting and I'm like, I don't know, because I was, I was like, I don't know enough. I didn't know it anyway, enough about real-time assistance and um, what's available out there. So I was kind of like, well, listen, you're the one that wants to police things and have someone at my house to make sure I'm not doing nothing nefarious. So like you can set the parameters. And then I, there was a tweet that I said like that, right? But once I spoke to my advisors, they're like, hell no, you're not going to let this guy play with charts. If you want, if he wants to play real fucking poker, let's sit down at a poker table, like with cards and chips at Poker Go Studio. We could do both of us. They have on set, they have on set 30 minute testing for COVID. There would be like, you know, say two people and one jib guy. So we could theoretically do that. Obviously, he's not going to agree to do something like that. So the other, you know, so ultimately it comes down to this. He challenged me, right? I agreed to his format. I, I agreed to best, his best game under his format on his approved platform, right? And his number of hands. I was going to, I said, let's play 10K hands. He's like, nope, 25. Da, da, da. So he, agreed, he got like everything. It's like, imagine that the, the negotiation goes like this. I'll challenge anybody heads up to the world as long as they agree to this, this, and this, and this. And I go... Okay, but no charts. Wait a minute, that's not fair, right? It's just like, it's so disproportionate. And you know, the pregame went, has gone really well for me, I think, because it was nice to see virtually, una almost unanimously, except for Sean D. People look at me at this and go, dude, wait a minute. You're this like heads up crusher who's a six to one favorite and you need fucking training wheel charts? You need cheat sheets? Because that's what they are. The definition of a cheat sheet is something that you look at. Like if you go to do a football draft or a hockey draft, you're like, oh wait, let me check this, uh, what's on my list here? It's fine for, you know, a hockey draft or whatever. But if we're going to play poker, what's wrong with the idea that we use your brain, my brain, no aids, no pre-aids, no note, notepads that will help, the, you know, define decisions. And ultimately, um, he came back with an offer that I modified, except he says, all right, fine. No charts, but like, let's show all of our whole cards. Okay. I agreed to show a, a, a portion, like a small portion of my whole card because it's another thing like benefits him. Right? Because he going into this match, he has no idea how I'm going to play. No clue, right? So do I really want to give him like the first thousand hands and give him like all the data on exactly what I'm doing in every spot so he can like use his fucking software machine to punch in the numbers and be like, all right, well, I know how to like exploit that. Like it's really, 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 really stupid, but I'll do it for the sake of the show and for sake of like creating a, you know, a nice, um, you know, thing for the viewers to watch. I think it's much more fun when you can see some pull cards. So I'll do that in small portions, but I'm not going to like show every one of my hands. It seems like it's absurd. I want to win this thing. I know that the line is way not in my favor. And my goal is to make this as competitive as possible, you know, with the chance of winning. I'm going to be working hard. I got about two weeks, oddly enough, which is a funny joke from the old days to uh, put in some, you know, hardcore training. And, uh, and that's what I plan on doing. And I plan on November 1st showing up Hopefully a million dollars is enough because that's what we get for World Series of Poker is, is like a max deposit for 30 days. And um, I'll be ready to play, you know. And it, one other thing I'll just share since I'll get it all out. The way that I see it, what I'm willing to agree to, and I mentioned this, is I wanna, I'll play at least two-hour sessions, okay. Then at the two-hour mark, both of us can agree to play an additional hour, which we would. And then we continue to check in with each other every hour on the hour. Whoever wants to quit can quit at any point. I'm willing to do that four times a week, so essentially every other day at, their, at, the, their, at the bare minimum, right? If I, if I feel like I'm getting crushed one day after two hours, I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. You know, you, we'll, we'll come back in a couple of days. So as far as I'm concerned, um, incorporating Poker Go makes a lot of sense to, you know, improve the quality and the production so that people can really get, like, you know, a lot out of watching it. So, and the other thing, just, I know Terrence wants to probably talk, but, um, you know, the action player makes the rules. That's how it's always been in poker. The guy who's, you know, you've got the worst of it by the market says it's what, yeah. five or six to one. The action player in every time you go to a game and an action player says, no, like, I don't this, want to play that It's game. akin to this. It's akin to this. Imagine you're playing a guy in a PLO game, right? And you're playing two five or whatever, right? And a guy's stuck like 40,000 and you're playing two five and he goes, everybody, let's put 25 bucks in and run a flip. And the rest of you go, no, no, I'm sorry. I don't do uh, neutrally be uh, – I won't do that, right? You don't appease the guy, right? So for all intents and purposes, this is an opportunity for him. I could just walk away and say, nah, never mind, I don't want to play. So he wasted all those months of time and opportunity because he's obviously a favorite. Like 
It's, it's mind-boggling the amount of entitlement where he thinks he has any say in the rules. You threw out the challenge. I tell you what they are. If you accept them, great. And if not, we don't play. You know, that's how it works if you're the favorite. You make concessions to the player who uh, you certainly don't, you know, think that you're going to get to use charts <laughs> when the other player doesn't want to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things is, is that, like, if you, did, if you did sort of walk away from the challenge, you know, Doug would use this as such a big moral victory and sort of like, oh, he's scared and he's a big talker and look at him, he's not a man of his word and blah, 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 blah. So I think that would be a win for him. So I don't, I don't see you ever, ever, ever doing that, even if he continues to go down this negotiation path. I agree with you that in the, the court of public opinion, you've definitely run, won this battle because um, – you pointed this out, um, but you know, even some people who are fans of his are kind of saying, "Like, look, you're you're going a little too far." And and it is strange to sort of for this to be, especially pre-flop, the the hill to die on, um, because as you've pointed out, like memorizing pre-flop charts for two players isn't hard. It is for it is for like nine players because you've got like oh, early position versus late position and small blind, and you know, there's like you could have multi-way pots, but heads up isn't that hard to do. The only pushback I think I am ever seeing against you on the side, Daniel, is that you did say um, in an earlier tweet that you were, that you were okay with charts. You didn't have a strong opinion on charts. So you're saying now that like, you know, people came, you know, got near and, and kind of said, well, don't let him, don't let him use the preflop charts or, or, or is well, yeah. it? But what I mentioned is like, I have advisors who are advising me on the match. Right. And I don't, like I said, I'm green to a lot of this stuff. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen what's out there. And the problem is, is like they understand it. They know what he has. And it's not like the fear is this. And I'm not saying that this is a fact, but the fear is that it is not simply just a preflop game. It's not just a preflop chart. It is a chart that is a root of a game tree that goes on for turn and river. And it doesn't matter anyway, because the bottom line is the guys who were advising me literally said, you cannot play if he plays with charts, because that's, that's, that's like a, a no-go for them, non-negotiation, not non-negotiable for us. So for me, I didn't know. I was like, you can probably, I didn't assume. I never thought he would want to use them in real time. Like, I thought maybe, like, okay, you know, you're after a hand, you check or something like that. But I've been playing poker for 20-something years, and I know that he mentioned that, you know, online poker players have been doing this for a long time, and that's fine, and that's true, but it doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it good for the game. Like, if average Joe knew, right? If so, so random guys playing heads up against you, Terrence, and thinks, you know, whatever, he's got a shot, and you're using complicated, complex preflop solvers and a randomizer, so you're playing perfectly preflop, but in doing nothing. He didn't know that, and he finds that out weeks later. Don't you think he'd be pissed, even though you're not breaking any rules, right? Right. So sometimes you can do something that's within the rules, but it's still really shitty to do something like that. And this is a case where that's true. So, again, when it was much more in-depth explained to me, I was like, okay, well, fuck that. There's no way we're doing that. Uh, and just uh, a tweet that uh, Isaac Axon sent out, and he says, how is there a big fight about using charts for preflop and head up no limit? There are four nodes. You can rewrite a complete preflop head up no limit strategy on a napkin and memorize it in 15 minutes. Um, so well, maybe you know, I could. I don't know if the rest of us would. would, would I respond to that. that. I respond to that, and I said I'm open to making napkins prohibited as well. <laughs> like if we want to just eliminate napkins, I'm down to do that too. But you're but saying, you're, you're, so you're saying that his preflop charts. Hold on, someone, him- someone came up. Someone came up with a really good tweet after I said that. Not that this is going to happen, but someone said like, "Well, if you ban napkins, and what is like." What is it? Where is Doug? What is Doug going to put his tears in or something like that? <laughs> but but you're saying like his preflop charts would give him access to postflop things because I mean obviously obviously I think you guys both agree that you're not allowed to run anything postflop. But you're saying you're saying that if he's allowed to have preflop charts, I mean, are you are you picturing like a wall of things like seven four deuce rainbow and like all the possible things with that or, or what's what's the danger if like if it's really just like okay ace five offsuit i'm gonna three bet him 13 percent of the time or whatever um yeah but the, it, it, the but the strategy can be bifurcated um past that right so you can have it color coded you can have it randomized pre-flop to do say something with ace three but also attach it to what you will be doing with your c-bet percentage on flops turns and rivers as well based on different board textures or whatever like you can get very very complex with it so whatever base strategy that you set up in your pre-flop chart could be the root of a sort of visualized game tree that helps guide you make more like, closer to GTO decisions on flop, turn, and river. And that's just like a big no-no as far as I'm concerned. All right, so we're at November 1st. We're at uh, 25,000 hands, is that right? Yeah, well, so the deal is this. It's a 25,000 hand match at two and 400, two tables. Um, at 12-5, halfway through the match, if the player who's getting killed uh, wants to say uncle and just wave the white flag, he can do that, bow out. Um, and if 
he, the low, losing player wants to play, the winning player must continue the match. And in addition to that, if both players agree for the second 12-5, we can kick up the stakes if uh, we feel like we want to. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm tr- I'm, I've am i been speaking to, and I imagine he is too, to Maury and Brent over at Poker Go in terms of like how we can maybe potentially for some of it, you know, do some battleship or, you know, where we're both there and, you know, obviously incorporate. Because World Series of Poker software uh, leaves a lot to be desired, to put it lightly, right? In terms of like, you can't even, you can't get hand histories, it's illegal. You can't, uh, um, like, there's no, act, there's no way to show whole, whole cards on a delay, really. So, so there's some, there's some um, challenges that way in terms of how to do it. And uh, I think one of the ways would possibly be to, you know, do it at the studio. But again, I'm, I'm open to, when it comes to that stuff, I'm open to doing whatever it takes to make the, the show good and, uh, you know, get it done. So it's going to be on Poker Go in some format. We're not we don't sure. Know right. We don't know. We don't know. I probably free pay. I don't know. Like, I really don't because it's a long match, right? You're talking about 25,000 hands or at least, you know, the first 12, five. So it's a lot of hours, right? We're doing that. Uh, the one thing I will add that we, um, we both agreed upon and he reached out to me and I believe him as well. And I'm fine with it, even though he is an, an instructor for his training site, Kane Callis. Is a guy named, he was Kangas online. And actually, many years ago when I was playing, uh, practicing to play uh, Victor Blom, Isildur, uh, I played matches against Kangas. And I actually beat him back then. Okay, King, he, he mentioned that to me. So, so he said he feels like he's a perfectly impartial you know, narrator. He understands heads up. He's a high-level player. So I felt like for this thing, rather than go with, um, you know, like just like the fun crew, we want to have like, you know, just sort of somebody who's really kind of an expert at this specific format. And, you know, he's got a, it seems like, you know, it'd be a good choice. So you got two weeks to become a heads up, no limit uh, specialist. That shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, not really. I don't think so. Like, I, I mean, I'm shocked, like, because I've started my study a couple weeks, right? More intensely the last few weeks. And uh, I will say that, um, you know, my advisors, if you will, have been rather impressed with how quickly I'm downloading things. Because I do have a poker brain that's been around for 20 years that's, you know, been always adaptable and learning new things. It's obviously more difficult to learn in this new format, but thankfully, you know, I've done work a couple of years ago that is similar to this kind of stuff, which is, you know, in the framework of game theory, optimal GTO kind of stuff. So um, it's coming along. I feel like uh, say every two, three days, I have a new tool that I'm, you know, sort of unleashing. And then I have a new framework. It's almost like, you know, stripping my game down and like, okay, let's rebuild it in such a way that uh, can be competitive. Right. And, um, it feels like, uh, like, listen, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a favorite. I would not bet on myself as a favorite, but if I could get six to one on myself, I would take that price. I mean, one thing I have learned about heads up, which is pretty nuts is the variance. If you are, let's say you're about a five to 10% favorite over somebody, theoretically in heads up to hope, you could go on theoretically, and this is a long shot, an 80 buy-in downswing, 80 buy-ins as a five to 10% favorite. Seems nuts, right? So what that tells you is like, there's going to be a lot of hands where, you know, it's ace king against jacks, the money goes in, and that's going to be like a full buy-in, right? If you run, you know, five, six buy-ins ahead or below EV, that's probably going to, you know, be the difference. Now, there's obviously another key component of, of all of it is like, you know, who's going to win the battles, right? You know, but even the, the person who wins all the battles and is out playing the other one, this is poker. It doesn't mean that they win, you know, as long as, you know, the other guy runs hot in the key, key situations. Yeah, we, we, we saw how much variance, obviously, you know, PLO is different, but the Galfon Challenge, Veni Vidi, uh, up a million, then comes, comes back to, to down a million. So, I mean, one million swings in that game. Um, no longer a six to one favorite, by the way, po- just pulled up poker shares, some money coming back to the DNEG side. Uh, Daniel is plus 400. You can come, uh, you can get Polk at minus 526. So some money uh, probably as a result of, of this week's little Twitter back and forth, uh, the market likes Daniel a little bit better than it did last week. Uh, I'm blocked by Timex, so I don't see those tweets anymore. <laughs> well, you can still go on poker shares. Like, why are you you're not really blocked by Timex? Yeah, Timex blocked me. I have no why? idea why. They posted no it. No idea. It's too funny. He posted it's because you're, you're the radical left. No, I can't even remember. I was whining about something in a basketball game or something. I don't know. Oh, it's uh, Spicy P. Was it? I don't know. It, it, He's Canadian. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised more people don't block me, actually. So it's all, it's all good. Uh, do, let's get on some tweets, Roscoe. All right. You're going surfing on the internet. 
Uh, the first one is a reply to the Icaxon tweet about uh, writing the, the nodes down on a, on a napkin. And it's Phil Galfon. And he says, thank you. This is what I've been wondering. We're starting to think maybe I didn't understand Don't Limit. Um, Terrence, and then there was a response to that, right? I actually posted this. It oh, was, did you? Okay. Uh, yeah, because I, I, it's what I kind of related to. I was like, what are people talking about? And this guy kind of, ex, ex, I, maybe you guys can ex, answer the question. It, but he says, uh, I don't get it though. If the strat is that simple, does it not make it, does it not make it look more dumb? Polk has to use charts. I'm not entirely sure what side of the argument Isaac is on here. No, that's definitely what he's saying. You know, Isaac is definitely saying is like, well, he's saying first of all that it's who cares. Like he doesn't say think it's a big deal. And secondarily, uh, and Phil Galfon and most people agree that as long as your preflop strategy is like pretty close to good being perfect is all not all that relevant. It doesn't matter all that much. The, neat, the meat and potatoes of poker hands uh, in No Limit Hold'em happen on uh, Flop, Turn, and River. But as I said, you know, my bigger concern is not simply just the memorization of what to open with on the button, right? Like, that's pretty much established for most people. Like, okay, you know, you fold 10-deuce offsuit and you open with 10-7 offsuit on the button, right? Okay, we got that down. That's like, that doesn't take a lot of memorization skills. But uh, the bigger concern is, like I said, if you are using sort of like a visualization game tree that starts from a pre-flop, um, you know, sort of a randomized mixed strategy, then uh, it can get more complex. But I mean, it's not necessary to do that. And, you know, I don't, I'm not going to do it. So neither is he. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, your buddy at Norman Chad, uh, if we're suddenly talking about what is good for a right and or good for the game. How is it that you essentially reversed yourself on unlimited reentry? He's talking to you, Daniel. Uh, is unlimited reentry right or good for the game? Uh, we're talking about what is good for you at this point. Okay, so let's talk. Like, you know, you were talking about blocking people on Twitter, and he's like that close because, like, the guy's been <laughs> such a like. He's been such a biz- like. He's he's evidence that like it's never too late to become like an online troll because he's been like stalkerazzi trolling me for like a year and a half, right? My position on reentry tournaments has not moved. It's so ridiculous, right? Imagine this. I would rather play six-handed poker or eight-handed poker than nine-handed poker. That doesn't mean I'm going to, like, you know, not play nine-handed tournaments. I think in seven-card stud, you know what a stupid rule is? I think it's a dumb rule when you can bet twice on, on you know, on, on when you pair on four street. Does that mean I'm not going to play stud tournaments? I don't like reentry, okay? I wish every tournament was a freeze-out, right? That doesn't mean, first of all, that I'm not going to play in these tournaments. And if there are re-entries, like, why wouldn't I just simply play by the actual rules of the game, right? It's so insane. Like, he's just looking for things to, like, to come at me for. And this one's bizarre. Because I don't think you understand what the word consider means. At the end of 2019, I was like, man, I really hate these fucking re-entry tournaments. I wonder what it would be like if I played a year without doing it. So I was considering maybe doing that, right? But then, like, obviously I'm getting these bracelet bets and they're all re-entry tournaments and my opponents are going to do bracelet bets. But they're all going to re-enter. So what, well, am I just going to fucking burn equity and be like, oh no, principle. I'm not gonna re-enter. You all get uh, you know, as many bolts as you want, but I'm not I'm not gonna take the same amount. So it just didn't make sense. I talked to a lot of people about it. If I genuinely felt, okay, if I genuinely felt that me choosing to not play any re-entry tournaments anymore would have even one percent impact on re-entry tournaments like being eliminated, I would do it. But there's no no way that's gonna happen. If I don't play re-entry tournaments, they go on right? They are the norm. Too many venues, especially for live events, right? For live events, um, you know, these venues, it's just, the, it's just all about the bottom line. The re-entries make the money, right? They're just a profitable endeavor to do that. And they need to, to justify having this event at their venue. They need to do that. Obviously we're under COVID time. So we can switch that to online poker and say a lot of these sites hold these huge guarantees, right? And one of the ways to ensure hitting those numbers is to do re-entry. And a lot of people do like them. I, like I said, I would happily support no reentry. So the idea that I've switched my stance on it is so fucking dumb. It's so dumb, but so is he. He's getting to the point. Like I have some friends because I was always fine with them, but I have, but I have some people who can't stand that fucking guy. And I didn't. I was always fine with him, but now I see what they're talking about. He's just like I don't know. He's gone next level. He's like he's like troll number one right now, and that's all he does. He sits there and freaking trolling people. I've, I've had him muted for like a year, and then. He once sent me a DM, DM that he wasn't happy about something I said. But you, you know, you mentioned that that you know your 
decision making whether or not to re-enter or play re-entry tournaments won't affect the tournament scene but you do have some influence in one place that does do some re-entry tournaments and you talked about the guarantees and online and i know gg wanted to make a super huge splash with the world series and online do you do you you know in your world would you rather have smaller guarantees and your and no re-entries it sounds like it and if so is that something that you can you think you can convince the gg poker execs or is it that they have to bar- battle against party and stars and all these other guys so they don't want they also they also have to, to play the game as well. Yeah, I'm at a place where I think what you do is, is you make sure that you offer a healthy diet of both, right? One of the biggest, one our flagship event on GG Poker is the GG Masters. And now there's the GG Masters High Roll, right? We have a prestigious event with half a million dollars going to the winner at the end of the year, all freeze outs, okay? So this was like our flagship event, right? Now, obviously to compete in the market, you know, with these guarantees and things like that. Reentry makes sense. It's also, again, profitable for the sites that are doing that. So I understand that. Listen, just because I don't like them doesn't mean that other people don't, you know, that other people are going to agree with me in this situation. So what I'd like to see is just, especially with very prestigious events, like the main events, you know, like the World Series of Poker main event, I would feel pain in my heart if the actual main event, not the online version, had like reentry in it, right? Because there's something special about one bullet, go home, right? So like a super high roller bowl, that, that's prestigious to me. Like I, I always say to people, one of the key factors, if you want to make your event prestigious, like more prestigious than other, is to make it a freeze out. Because when you make it re-entry, it kind of make, it dumbs down the event a little bit to a certain degree, especially when you have a guy like, you know, the Bellagio one, which is fine. It's unlimited at the end of December. Oh, a guy rebought seven times and won the tournament. Like six times he went broke, but he won the tournament. And I'm sometimes that guy, Right. But his idea that I'm doing what's best for me is so cockamamie fucking stupid because first and foremost, they benefit me because I'm bankrolled to do that. When the World Series of Poker had rebuy events, I crushed in those things. I rebought like a madman up to 49, 50 times in, in certain spots, but I won. I was the number one person trying to get those eliminated because I thought that they, they damaged the brand of a bracelet at the time when you like could just fire as many bullets as you want. So his freaking stupid fucking narrative that I'm like only looking out for what's best for me is backwards because re-entry is good for me. Okay. Obviously. Yet I'd like to see less of it. I'd like to see more freeze ups. So this fucking, I have I said fucking enough? Cause I know he hates when I say fucking this fucking narrative of his is so fucking ass backwards that, uh, you know, he might end up with fucking, he might end up with teeth in his backwards fucking ass. I don't know. I can say that it's my own podcast. I'm just saying, I don't know how that would happen. I wouldn't put them there, but it's theoretically possible that, you know, he could end up sitting on a, you know, sitting on his dentures and then getting stuck up there. So aside from all that, and I get it, you've explained that that's he's wrong. But aside from that, people can change their minds. Like you know, you did that 15 years ago, back when reentries, you know, you blasted off 40 or whatever it was in a 1K. But that's 15 years. Like you, people can change their minds. It's not. It's grown-ups do that like, absolutely I don't know what the- no no quite you're, you're having to right but that's the funny thing is like in this case i haven't changed my mind no i know like, you yeah that's what i was saying like, like I'm, you explain that but i'm saying like even if you didn't people change their minds and they they think oh yeah maybe i've matured and I now i understand it i guess it's a fair way to say like first of all we had never we hadn't we didn't made we hadn't made final agreements on the doug match in terms of like exactly what we're doing right so we were spitballing on twitter so the pre-flop charts, things like nothing had been settled at that point, right? Not, like if I could go back and not put that tweet out, I would, right? Because it like creates some ambiguity. Like, oh, you said there, you know, you're going to let me decide and I'm not going to, right? Well, listen, we didn't have that agreed upon yet. My advisor said, fuck no. So once I learned some more information about it, oh, yes, I changed my mind. Well, I didn't, I actually didn't really change my mind. I just was like not understanding what I was saying when I just said charts because I didn't know the extent, like I said, of, of you know, what some of these charts look like. Uh, all right, let's move on. Um, I found this tweet really interesting, and it was Phil Galfond, <clears throat> and he uh, tweeted out, "We're so off. We so often criticize the plays we see on TV from the comfort of our couches. I think it's only fair to also give credit where credit is due. I recently watched Phil Helmuth on Poker Go's High Stakes Duel and wrote down some thoughts. And here it is. And it's going to take a bit, but I thought it was interesting, and I want to get your guys' take on this. Uh, when you see a talented poker player make decisions that seem wrong to you, you have to ask yourself." Are they making bad plays or do they know something I don't? You often will never learn the answer to that question. On unsatisfying, I know. Nevertheless, I believe it's an important one to ponder, especially regarding your opponents. But even if you're just watching poker icons battle it out on TV, 
Phil Helmuth is one of, if not the most iconic poker player in the world. He's won more World Series of Poker bracelets than anybody, and it doesn't look like he'll be caught anytime soon, perhaps not ever. Yet, as uh, for as long as I can remember, Phil's abilities at the table haven't had the respect of many of poker's younger generations. I'm sure this is incredibly frustrating for Phil. <laughs> we all know that it is. Uh, imagine him thinking, I keep winning year after year and they still don't respect my game. What more can I do? I don't recall if I ever criticized Phil, Phil's play publicly, but I'll admit I have privately. He does a lot of strange things, um, things uh, that I can, can't come up with a good ex- explanation for. You just can't fold certain hands off a seven big blind stack. No way he knows some weird secret about technical spots like that, right? Um, and he goes on and he basically just says that, Um, you know, he has a new, uh, found respect for Phil's play. He doesn't completely understand it. He doesn't agree with it, but he came around to Phil's style of play a little bit. And, and I thought it was pretty cool for Phil to come out and say that because for the forever, Phil's been trashed by most poker players on some, because, and we'll point to a a bunch of decisions that he does. Like he'll raise full, uh, two threes with four big blinds or something. And that is, there's no chances, right? But we tend to, you know, wipe the brush, that same brush on that play on a bunch of other hands that maybe we don't understand and Phil's doing something differently. So um, I thought that w- it made me think about, uh, you know, some of the things that I've looked at Phil's play and thought, what the heck is he doing there? Um, you know, uh, there's, and there's some, and again, it, you, it mixes in with some indefensible play. And a lot of times I think back to the, I think it was a Raz tournament he won in the World Series three or four years ago. And I think on f- Fourth and fifth, he bricked, and the other guy had like one to a wheel, and he called a big raise on Fifth Street and ended up uh, making a wheel and beating him and, and winning the bracelet. And I, it, it just you, again, you get we get caught up, I think, or at least I do, in looking at some of these specific hands and just going, oh, I, I don't know what he's doing here, and he did this over here, so it must be terrible. But, there, but I thought it was in this. there's a huge lesson in this, and it, it makes me think of Ted Forrest. There was a time where Ted Forrest was the king, right? He was you know crushing everybody. But he was doing stuff that you could look at and be like, this is not correct, right? In limit hold'em, Terrence Chan can likely speak to this. Under the gun, he's limping in with king three of spades. Well, that's not theoretically correct play, right? Here's the issue. And actually, Ted is one person who who taught me this. Is like, too often, people uh, compare their A game to an opponent's F game, right? And completely ignore some of the things that they do really, really well, right? And Phil Helmuth is a perfect example of that. In one sense... His level of aggression is passive. His pre-flop play is substandard, right? There's errors there. What does he do well then? Why is he able to succeed in so many ways? Because other people are willing to take risks and do dumb things because it's theoretically correct where they risk all their chips where he doesn't, right? So if people don't, like, here's the thing. What Phil Helmuth does is incredibly exploitable, right? Because he does not bluff post-flop nearly enough, okay? So he's not balanced in that way. In that way. If you're willing to make the, you know, the counter to fill and just be like, you know, screw it. If he puts big chips in, I'll just fold, right? But, he, but it's true. In a lot of cases, people are not willing to do that. They're like, oh, my God, I got too big a hand, right? The problem is, is Phil's not, you know, not bluffing there. So he's, he takes it so seriously, his last bit of chips or whatever. Like, let's take a look at two of the hands Antonio played, and I told him about that. So Antonio punted in this last one, completely punted. There's no way that based on the pre-flop play and folks post-flop play that, that Antonio was supposed to lose. But there's two key hands. One – Phil limped in, he raised with nines, the flop was jack five three rainbow, Antonio bet, Phil moved all in, short stack, right, on a jack five three rainbow, short stack, so you're like, oh, whatever, but like, he always has a jack, bro, you know, you just have nines, and you're like, okay, theory, in theory, you're supposed to call, because you could have ace four suited, you could have four six suited, but he's so heavily weighted towards having a jack here, that you're just absolutely punting, there was another key pot, another key pot, where it came like, uh, where it was like king eight, seven deuce okay and uh there was two hearts out there right and antonio like raises the turn with sevens and deuces and phil helmuth goes all in on king eight seven deuce okay sevens and deuces are never ahead of phil helmuth's range in this spot he is not the type of player to be like yolo i have a flush draw straight draw combo where i have top pair right he's always going to have two pair crush so antonio punts off in those two spots right so essentially despite phil helmuth Playing a style that you, if you, you know, you want to like pick it apart, you can. People still fuck up and they punt everything. You know how every time you see Phil on TV, they're like, they'll just give me the chips. They'll just give me the chips. Well, too many players do. I'll tell you the kind of players who don't though. Guys like Fedor Holtz, 
okay? And Fedor had some comments because every time he played with Fedor, Fedor, every single hand you'll see, Fedor against Phil, every streak of every hand, Fedor outplayed him. Every, I'm not even saying like, he didn't even get outplayed on a single street. Like every single street, Fedor outplayed him because he had a real deep understanding of the exploitative uh, things that Phil Helmuth does that's successful against a lot of other people. But he, uh, he knows the adjustment on how to beat that, right? So Phil Helmuth, sometimes his pre-flop play can be rather aggressive where he's like re-raising with 9-3 offsuit, 10-3 offsuit. But here's the thing. People should call his three bets more often. Why? Because his post-flop play is so passive, right? So people fold. So like if I open with ace nine and like someone good three bets, I mean, I'm just folding. You shouldn't do that against Phil because Phil is not going to punish you on flop turn river. So the point of the whole thing is, is that Phil has figured out a way to, that works for him. And when people don't try to exploit that, he's going to be very successful. And I think that, you know, that's what's allowed him to, you know, continue to stay relevant in some spots. Having said that, I just think if you, if, and I've played in these high roller events, right? On a regular basis, if he's playing these 25K plus buy-ins, like the way that he is, it's just, he's giving up way too much by just playing too easy. It's he's too easy to play against for a lot of these good players. The weaker ones, like this is what he thinks. He, he has this misconception that all young players play the same way, like they did 10, 15 years ago. No, no, no. The young players of today are fucking good, bro. They're not punters. They don't just go, YOLO, I have middle pair. They're folding sets. They're folding flushes. They're like, they're, you know, they're getting, you're not trapping them as, as easy. Like, I've, I felt it this year in the World Series of Poker when a guy just folded top pair against me on the turn. I was like, holy shit, you know? What? And he was right to do that. I was getting exploited. But um, anyway, um, yeah, that's I it. Want, I want to ask you something. Would, would, you know, you say it's a style that works for him. Would anybody else other than Phil Helmuth get away with playing the way he does? Like you say, like under bluff, like consistently under bluffing post flop. Like if you, if you took a guy and he just played like Phil Helmuth, there was it something about his personality that gets him paid off, like in spots where he's not supposed to get paid off. I, like, no, could anybody else be Phil Helmuth? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. So in 2004 and that entire era from 2002 to 2010, the thing that was similar about mine and Phil's game was the passivity post flop. Right, I was very aggressive pre-flop, min raising, making smaller raises than most, throwing a lot of jabs, throwing a little seabed on the flop. But I never fucking bluffed the turn of the river because I didn't have to, because the because I was playing exploitatively where I didn't need to be balanced because people were calling too much for big bets on turn. Is river. that because you're you, or would would Ross have been able to it do just that? Just it should yeah anyone because that's so, so. What you look at is you look at what are the what is the field doing? And what is the field doing wrong? Back then, people who had ace king they were playing it face up by the turn, right? You know, like they might bet an eight six deuce flop. But then if the three hits the turn and they bet again, they never have ace-king. They always have, that's like the most easy way to do it. Like they'll bet when they have aces, kings, or queens, they check when they have ace-king, right? In that very simplistic way. So when the field is doing stuff like that, it allows you to play, you know, like a passive style, post-flop, um, get away from traps. And, uh, you know, it still is effective, I would say, with like, you know, your average Joe, but players have gotten a shit ton better, even in small $500 buy-ins, and it's going to work less because the key difference is now – a lot of people, you know, will fold in spots where, you know, they wouldn't fold before. So absolutely anyone could play like that and succeed. Not today as much as, you know, like, again, Phil's not going to succeed at the highest levels with that strategy. It's just, I love the guys, you know, I know a ton of respect for what he's able to do. And I think that some part of him knows this is true. But like, if he sits down with like, you know, the Jason Kuhn, Makita Bajikowski, um, Is it Jones? Like, you know, you know, the, the, that crew, right? His, his, his tricks are not going to work. Like, his check, check, you know. It's so funny because one of the things he says, and this is what he does, he bullshits with his mouth. With his mouth. He said to Antonio, this is so funny. He's like, if I didn't hit the ace, I was going to move in on you on the river, right? He checked in the dark. <laughs> but he said to Antonio, he's like, well, oh, you know, I was going to move in on the river if I didn't hit the ace. He's like, dude, you fucking check dark. We all heard you. It's on video. But he says shit like that. So that he says stuff like that, like, oh, I was going to raise all in. And like, He's just bullshitting. He's never doing it. He's just saying it. Yeah. Well, you have one way of describing it. I have another. <laughs> That's what you call chewing off your leg to get out of the trap, kid. Uh, all right. Uh, let's, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Let's hit uh, a couple of voicemails. Email number one. Hey, PokerCast. Jimmy from Baltimore. Thought I'd share a quick story with you uh, about the Stanley uh, Cup playoffs. So, I was listening to a podcast from you guys. It had to be over a year ago now, and uh, it's from last year's Stanley Playoffs, not Stanley Cup Playoffs, not the ones that just finished. So um, you did a show that was like half poker, half hockey talk. 
Uh, I tuned down on the hockey talk because I'm not a big hockey guy, so um, switched off, did something else. Fast forward like a year listening to the podcast, and I uh, finished an episode, and my podcast app takes me to the most recent unfinished uh, episode of the show, which happened to be the hockey episode. Um, I didn't realize it had switched over, so I'm listening to it. You guys are all big on the lightning at that point, and I figured, why not? I'll take a sweat and uh, threw 100 bucks on the lightning at like 7.5 to 1 to win the Stanley Cup playoffs. Fast forward like two, three weeks, I go to check it to see how they're doing, how my bet's looking, and I realize the Stanley Cup playoffs aren't even going on. This is like the off season, and I listened to an old episode that was like a year and a half old. Um, <laughs> so I let it ride, had to sweat it out for like over a year with COVID going on, but um, was able to run good, and uh, the lighting took it down, obviously, and uh, cashed on the 7-1. So I uh, appreciate you guys, and uh, if you ever in Baltimore, I owe you some drinks. Thanks. Oh, that is fantastic. That is it's awesome. so good, too, because the Lightning were swept in the first round. <laughs> Last year, they didn't <laughs> It's so good. <laughs> like, every part of that story is amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, that's so good. All right, let's get to Baltimore for some cocktails. Yeah. Email number two. Hello, that poker podcast. Again, I love the show. This is Paul from South Jersey. I was wondering if... Henry Orenstein gets enough credit for you know the whole the whole car the whole card whole camera seems like uh, it's like an afterthought and it just was so important to poker but you know rarely brought up well I'd love to hear your opinion thanks man yeah, Paul, Paul from down the shore that's uh, that's a good question you know um, Maury Escandani tells a story about about that and I think he was close with Henry and back in the day when Henry wanted to bring the card tables and show the games um, I think Moritz says he just told Henry you're crazy nobody's going to want to do this forget it you know put that away and Henry's an inventor he was an inventor um, and just kept tinkering with it and kept tinkering with it and finally brought it to light but and of course Maury you know benefited more and drove the uh, TV poker industry more than anybody but yeah, no, I, I agree. I think Henry was an innovator and and uh, did great things with it. What what do you guys think? Yeah. Oh, no, I, I really liked Henry a lot. You know, he was obviously there with High Stakes Poker and he was way ahead of his time. And, like, I would highly recommend, and I don't even know the name of the book, but I'm sure if you look up a Henry, Henry Ornstein wrote a book about his life, okay? And it was riveting, right? Because this is a man who was in, he was in the camps. He was, uh, he was you know, he was he's a Holocaust survivor. He was in that. And just hearing the stories of how he survived and, you know, because part of what they did with a lot of the people that were in camp was, you know, they like if you had a special talent or skill, you know, you were useful. So they were going to like give you more food and, you know, give you opportunity. So he was like, he bullshitted his way through it, like claiming to be a mathematician, and, you know, engineer and all this kind of stuff. And he figured his way through and just hearing him describe it was just um, was amazing. But absolutely no question about it. You know, when he brought this to the forefront in poker, he had the patent years before it actually happened. I remember early on, like Eric Seidel, if it was up to Eric Seidel, and I, I can needle him about this, like poker would not be the same as it is today because he was vehemently opposed to showing his whole cards. He thought it was a dumb idea and thought it was really, really bad and no one was going to do it. Luckily, um, I think he's changed his, his tune on I that. I remember that it was like one of the first um, whole card cameras was, I think it was like the, the U.S. Poker Championship. Yeah. And they, ha- they have like uh, Eric like hiding from yeah. the camera, like showing his whole cards over here, looking at him over here, looking yeah, at him, he's, he's doing his best. To- and I remember watching that. Right. I was like in a bar or something like, what yeah. the hell is Seidel doing? Yeah. But uh, Henry, so for a lot of people that don't know, Henry also, he was an inventor and he invented the whole card camera, but he's more famous for something else. Transformers. If you've seen the movie Transformers and you've played with Transformers, which I did as a kid, he invented those. So he had a very creative brain. And, uh, you know, I think he is owed a lot because not only did he invent it, he put it into practice. He created the show High Stakes Poker. You know, he funded it. He put it to the forefront. And I think if you look at every poker show that's been on TV, and I'm, you know, I'm partial to some that I've been on, but I think High Stakes Poker ranks above all else by a long stretch. And Henry uh, Ornstein is responsible not just for creating the whole card cam, but even a show like that. So your, your book club uh, assignment of the week is I Shall Live, Surviving Against All Odds, uh, a memoir of his experiences during the Nazi Holocaust and survival in five concentration camps. So uh, there, will, there will be a test on it. Daniel will administer it next week. So, uh, you know, make sure you study up. Yeah. Is Henry in the Poker Hall of Fame? He is. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. I mean, that would be pretty nuts. Like, if, if you like, then what's the point of having a builder category at all? Although, yeah. like Scheinberg, if he doesn't go in next year, it kind of makes a mockery of, 
all the things that they said previously about why he wasn't in because, you know, yeah. there's no reason he shouldn't be. All right, uh, folks, that's going to wrap it up. We're keeping it to a hard hour this week. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. Thanks to you guys for getting together, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>